I'm not going to be long today, uh, but I have a message today that I believe that when God gave it to me, it ministered to me, and I was able to gain and grow from it. But not only that, gain grow from it, God brought so many things back to my memory because me and God been walking together for a really long time, and and, and even though we've been walking for a really long time, He teaches me stuff daily. I believe in daily growing. I, you know, when people say, well, I wasn't what I was last year. You know, I, I'm so much better this year. Well, I, I'm saying that it's not all about a, a leap. I'm making steps to be a better person every day. And this is outside of pastoring. This is outside of anything else I'm doing. Just personal growth in God. Because forget your position. Growing in God is something that we all should be doing and it has to be intentional last week that's what we spoke about was intentional spiritual growth but this week the question i want to ask the church and i want to ask everybody i want you to think about it within yourself i just want you to think the question is who are you who are you the next question as you see on the screen is who does God say you are? Many times when we size people up, or even when we size ourselves up, we can stand in front of the mirror and we will use our five senses to dictate who we are. We can look in the mirror. When I was a younger man, I used to look in the mirror and say, man, you know, I'm a little short. I wasn't that tall. I was about 5'10". You know, I wasn't six feet. I wasn't tall, dark, and handsome. And during there was a time in the 90s where that was the way to be. Michael Jordan was out with the bald head, and he was tall, and people really desired him, and the light skin phase had been passed on for men, so it was like, you know, I was in between. I didn't know where I was or who, what if, you know. So I had identity issues. I, I looked in the mirror, and I didn't see anything good. Look, let's look at my hairline. Your lips are too big. Your nose is too wide. You know, you know, you're, you're short and you're skinny. I was skinny at the You know, I wish I backed that up. But I was real skinny and scrawny at the time. And I was just like, look at you. Look at. I was like, I look at the mirror like, look at you. Look at yourself. And this was a self evaluation. This wasn't anybody behind me telling me this. This was how I was evaluating myself. So I looked at myself. I didn't like the sound of my voice. Even to the day sometimes, I'll hear myself in a recording. I'll be like, oh, God, you sound like that? Or I hear myself on the phone. I'm like, geez, your voice sounds all raspy and gurgly. And, was, and, and I'm looking at myself, and I'm like, why is my self-esteem so low? And all of us have had points in our lives where we looked at ourselves and realize that we did not like what we see. I remember one of the most worst times of my life was when I, I had my accident, and I remember uh, a few years later, I was going through a divorce, and I had lost my three children, um, not during the divorce, but the process of it. Um, and I wasn't allowed to see him. And I remember I was just looking at myself in the mirror one day, and that same thing came back again. Look at you. You're 30 years old. You got three kids. You're in a wheelchair. Who would want you? That's what I just kept telling myself. Who would want you? Now, mind you, nobody else was in the room with me. I'm looking at myself in the mirror, and I'm looking at all these things as negatives, but never looked up at how God viewed me. So at that time, who I was was a picture of everything negative and nothing good I could see in me. Listen to what I said. Uh, I want to give you a, a definition 
of what depression is. This is just my own personal thing. Because at this time, I was very depressed. And depression is a feeling of severe despondency or dejection. One of the things it says about it is that self-doubt creeps in and that swiftly turns into depression. Self-doubt. Has anybody ever doubted themselves? You're not good enough. You're not, you know, you, you, how, how could you go after that? You, you'll never get that. You'll never, you, how could you? You apply for that job. You're not even qualified. These are things that people don't even have to say to us. These are things that we are saying to ourselves. So when I begin to really think about why am I consistently viewing myself as less than or not good enough or inadequate, which is really the word. I wasn't good enough to find a wife. I wasn't good enough to, I, all, I didn't have enough money. All these things, I mean, I, anything bad you could think about somebody, I thought about it on my own. Mind you. We talk about this new thing about bullying. I was bullying myself. Has anybody been there? Amen. Listen to what I was. This is one thing I want to say to you. When I was alone, the devil has a way of getting you by yourself and putting thoughts in your mind and making it seem like it's you that are suggesting these things. Remember, the flesh and the spirit are constantly warring against each other. You have to make a decision to who you're going to listen to. Are you gonna believe the lie, or are you gonna believe the truth? Every day we have to make these decisions. Are we gonna believe the lie, or are we gonna believe the truth? The devil has, these are just three things I'm gonna give. Three things and three questions, or three suggestions that he normally makes to kind of watch out for. The first one is, the first question is, if God loves me so much, why am I suffering? I don't know anybody's story here. I don't know anybody's life. I don't know too much of what anybody's been through, but I know that everybody been in here has been through a period in their life where they've been suffering. And if you didn't know God during that time, and even if you did know God during this time, we still have a question in our minds. If God loves me so much, why is he allowing me to go through this? Why am I suffering? Why is he allowing this to continue in my life? Listen to what the Bible says. And this is Job 14, the first verse. It says, man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. But wait a minute, I thought my life supposed to be perfect. Well, God never said that. Man born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. So in other words, God is saying, hey, you're not gonna live forever. And while you're here, you're gonna go through some stuff. I think a lot of times we have a, a, a false misconception of what life is. Life is not 24 hours a day, seven days a week pleasure. I would like it to be, but that's not reality. Reality is the perfect man, which was Adam, that came, he was in a perfect state, he made a mistake, and he suffered. You think what you're going through bad, imagine getting kicked out of the garden and Imagine living with a woman that helped you get kicked out the God of Eve. <laughs> Imagine God directly cursing you for what you did. Imagine being in communication directly with God, and now it's a whole different setup. Imagine having everything given to you, and now you have to work for everything you get. Imagine growing something, and in the midst of that growing, weeds are coming up with it. Listen to what it says here. 2 Timothy, 3rd chapter, 12th verse. Yes, 
and everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution. So wait a minute, even if I'm saved, I gotta go through some stuff? Yes. Even if you save and love God with all your heart, you're gonna go through some stuff. Well, let's go through a couple of examples. You pick any prophet or man of God in the Bible, and I'll show you where they suffer. What makes you so different? One of the main questions I would ask God is, why me? As if, if he told me why, it would make a difference. We always want to know why. When we really should be asking for the solution. But we just want to know why. Why me, God? Why me? Why me? Why am I going through this? Why am I suffering? God, why? 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 I served you. I did these things. I taught for you. I've, I've helped people. I've delivered it as if that changes anything. You are going to go through some things while you're here. Listen to what it says. John, the 16th chapter, 33rd verse, 33rd verse. I have told you all this so that you may have peace in me. Here on earth, you will have many trials and sorrows. But take heart, because I have overcome the world. God is saying, listen, why are you here on this earth? You have a short amount of time. God promised us, what, three score and a ten, 70 years. Many of us live uh, a little beyond that, but we all kind of around the 75-year mark is kind of getting, you know. So our promised years are not very long. And within that time, God is saying to you, you're going to have some trouble. Many of us, here it is. This is the youngest person in this building is this young man right here. And I guarantee you, he's had problems in this short amount of time. My 15-year-old has had problems in this time. My 22-year-old has problems in that time. So you know me at 44, I done been through some stuff. And whatever age you are, you done been through some stuff. But one thing about being in God is you don't have to go it alone. See, have you ever, let me ask you something. I don't know if anybody here has ever been arrested or ever been in jail. I've never been in jail. Never, I've had my little scuffles with the law, but I've never been incarcerated. Do you know, if you ever watch a show like the first 48, do you know how the, the police interrogate you? First, they put you in a room by yourself and let you sit there. They don't be doing anything. They just be letting you sit there, and they just watch you. Don't you know what that's one of the devil's main tactics is to get you by yourself and get you alone and sit there for a while. And then when it's time, he comes in with a little question. Remember, the police ask you questions they already know. They really want to know and see if you're going to give up anymore. Just like the devil. Remember, he went to Adam and Eve. Should he not eat from all the food? He knew the answer to that. But this is the thing. If you're ever interrogated by yourself, what's the main thing that people normally say? I don't want to talk. I want my lawyer. We should be saying the same thing to the devil. I don't want to talk. I'm waiting for Jesus. Because he's my lawyer. I don't want to even discuss anything. I don't even want to talk fact fiction. I don't even want to know. Even if I, I don't even want to tell the truth until he's here. Because he is my lawyer. Because even if I'm guilty of the crime, he's forgiven me. Don't even just talk to the devil. Don't even. The only thing I want us to do to the devil is rebuke him. Amen? That's the only conversation I really want to have with him. I rebuke you. In the name of Jesus. No other comment. I don't need to answer them. I don't need there's certain things that even if I think it's myself, I need to rebuke out of myself. Amen. I need to crucify Randy every single day. 
Listen to what I said. Let me say that I, I, I want to move on. The next question, this is the, the next thing he does. The next thing the devil questioned us about is, why am I by myself? Or why don't I have anyone to help me? Have any of us asked ourselves that question? Usually when I'm going through something, I isolate myself. And the reasoning behind it is, well, I don't want anybody else to be affected. Or I don't want people to see me down. I'll shake it off or I'll, you know, I'll get by, you know. I, this is how I deal with stuff. But let me tell you something, when you're by yourself, you're very vulnerable. The Bible says in a multitude of counsel, there's safety. So in other words, if I'm going through something, I should be reaching out, not collapsing in. I'm guilty of that. And when I collapsed in and isolated myself, the next thing I'd be asking is, why am I by myself? Why well, I don't have anybody. Lord, I help other people. Why ain't nobody helping me? Not realizing that I'm the one that is not using the resources that God gave me. But I put myself in the situation, and now I'm bad blaming God. Lord, why did you allow me to be by myself? Why don't I have any help? I help people all the time, God. Why don't I have help? Not realizing that God is right there. Do you know your worth back slid the state? You one step away from God? I don't care how hard or far or turn up, whatever you done did. Don't you know God is right there to take you back? Remember, we run from God. God don't run from us. We run from Him. And we put things on Him that are not even Him. We blame Him for stuff that's not even Him. Well, God, you allowed it. In that case, God allowed you to be blessed. Did you blame Him then? We blame everything negative on God. It is not Him. God gives us free choice. We even blame him for our choices. Listen, look, listen. Let me tell you how far you can get from God. Let me tell you how far you can get from God. And I'm going to read Psalms 139. I'm starting at the seventh verse. Listen to what the guy who wrote this psalm is saying. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go to heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell in the furthest ocean, even there, your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. I could ask darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night. But even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as day. Darkness and light are the same to you. You made all the delicate inner parts of my body and knitted me together in my mother's womb. Thank you for making me so wonderfully complex. Your workmanship is marvelous. How well I know it. You watched me as I was being formed in other seclusion. As I was woven together in the darkness of the womb, you saw me before I was born. Every day of my life was recorded in your book. Every moment was laid out before a single day had passed. How precious are your thoughts about me, oh God. They cannot be numbered. I can't even count them. They outnumber the grains of sand. 
And when I wake up, you are still with me. How far can you be from God? You can't ever be away from God. He is ever present with you, even in your darkest moment. Even when you feel most alone, he is right there with you. But the devil will tell you you're alone. You can believe the lie or you can believe the truth. The truth is you're not alone. The lie is you're all by yourself. God's word is telling you he is ever present. There's nowhere you can go that he cannot be with you. You're alive, he's there. You're dead, he's there. You in that up, you up high, you're you that no matter where it is, God is right there with you. Listen to the last, listen to the last lie he likes to say. The third thing is, why did you make me like this? Or why did you allow me to be like this? I had an accident in 1999. I lost my ability to walk. Fractured my spinal cord and uh, had very bad nerve damage. So when I went through the phase of if you love me, why am I suffering? It went to, why am I here alone? Then it went to, why am I like this? What is it, God? Why, why, why did you leave me like this? What, what's going on? Why did you allow this to happen to me? Many of us have been through situations. It don't even have to be a physical thing. It could be financial. Lord, why am I, why am I broke? I work hard every day. I, I, I pay my taxes. I pay my tithes, I do all these things. God, why, why, why? Why do we always ask why? Does no one answer the why fix anything? No. If you ask God why, he said, because I felt like it. Would that make a difference? Matter of fact, it might, might hurt more of you if you really knew the why, but the point is, it's not about the why, it's the who. Lord, here I am going through this, Lord. Be with me. Help me out of this. Rescue me from this. Deliver me from this. I don't even need to know why I went through it. I don't care. I just need you to get me out of this situation. Listen to what it says. Some of the things, when I used to look in the mirror, those are the three things that the devil used to speak to me. Look at you. You ugly. You got a big head. You're too skinny. You're too this. You're too that. You're not good enough. You're too short. Your teeth are crooked. You walk all slow. You walk with a limp. Look at you. Look, 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 look at you. You're not good enough for that. She ain't gonna want you. He ain't gonna want you. Look at you. You don't deserve that. These are the things that the devil was speaking to me. And I made a decision one day that I don't want to hear his take of me. But what does God think of me? How does God see me? How does God see you? So let me tell you how God sees us. This is the good part. How does God view you? So, this is what I did one day. I went to church, and I was in church, I was crying. I was going through a lot, and I'm a man, and I cried, yes. And I didn't have a problem with it. Right in front of a church full of people. I was going through something, I needed God, I didn't care, because I wanted something from God. And that's how God was working in me at that time, so I cried, amen? amen. It's okay for men to cry. Amen. And if it's not, I'm saying it's okay. Amen. Listen to what, I begin to do. 
I heard a preacher talking. He was talking about how we see ourselves. And at the time, I was like, I don't care about that. And he began to go through the scriptures about us. Listen to what it says in Genesis, the 27th chapter. Excuse me. Genesis, the first chapter, the 27th verse. It says, so God created human beings in his own image. In an image of God, he created them. <laughs> Male and female, he created them. So when I heard that, I said, well, I can't be ugly because I was created in God's image. My head, my nose, nothing could be too big or too small because guess who I look like? I look like God. I look like God. I was created to look like him. So if I think I'm ugly, that must mean I think God is ugly. Well, I can't think that. God, you are made in the image of God. You are made in the image of God. You are made in the image of God. How can you be ugly if you are made to look like God? Not only are you made in his image, you're made in his likeness. So in other words, how he is, is kind of how you are. You're just a smaller version. So you mean to tell me that God made a mistake when he made you? No. He made you beautiful just the way you are. I don't care how nappy your hair is. God made your hair exactly how it is and it is beautiful the way it is. I don't care how straight your hair is. God made it beautiful just the way it is. He made it just for you. Amen? So now that we wiped out the fact that you ain't ugly and you ain't fat and you don't look the way that don't matter. I look just like God look because I'm made to look just like him. Listen well. Not only do you look good, listen to this, what it says in 1 John 1 and 7. It says, but if we are living in the light as God is the light, then we have fellowship with each other and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us of all our sin. So wait a minute. I look like God. And now his blood cleanses me and covers me. And I'm made perfect through the sacrifice of his son, Jesus Christ, my brother. So not only do I look good, I am good. And Jesus is my brother. Oh, but wait a minute. It gets even better. Listen to what it says, uh, 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 um, Acts 4 and 31. After this prayer, the meeting place shook, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit. Then they preached the word of God with boldness. So you mean to tell me, not only can I look like God, and I can be cleansed and cleaned, and be covered in the blood of Jesus, I can have God's spirit in me? Yes. You can have the Holy Spirit in you. You can have the very spirit of God in you. So not only can you look like him, not only can you be made to be in a state like him, but you can also have his spirit and power in you it's even better. What could be better than that? Let's keep reading. Romans 8 and 37. So not only do I look like him and act like him and I have his spirit in him, he had God's spirit in me. Look at what I am. Look what it says. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that loves us. That means if God loves me, which he says he does, I'm more than a conqueror. When you conquer something, what does that mean? That means it's done, I'm over, I have beat this thing. I'm more. 
So I look like him. I'm covered. I have his spirit in me. And I'm a conqueror because I'm connected to him. Wait a minute now. Look what else it says. First Peter 2 and 9, it says, but you are not like that. For you are a chosen people. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, Amen. God's very own possession. As a result, you can show others the goodness of God. For he called you out of darkness into wonderful light. So this is what I used to do every morning. This is good. <laughs> so the preacher gave me a thing to do every morning. I would get, he said, get in front of your mirror. Because the mirror is neutral. When you look in the mirror, the mirror doesn't have an opinion. The only opinion the mirror has is what you give it. When you look in the mirror every day, the only opinion that mirror is going to tell you is what you tell it. So when I looked in the mirror, instead of listening to what I was, I began to speak what I was to the mirror. And as I spoke to the mirror, the mirror was speaking back to me. So I would say, every day I would look in the mirror, I would say, mirror, mirror on the wall, who is the fairest of them all? And before the mirror would answer, I would say, you are. Because you're made in God's image. You're made in his likeness. You're covered in his blood. You're a child of God. You're filled with his Holy Spirit. You are a royal priesthood. You're a holy nation. You're more than a conqueror. And every day I would repeat this. And I would add more and more to it as I read the word of God. All of these things I begin to say every day, every day, every day. I begin to believe what God said about me. And I begin to reject the lie. I began to see myself how God sees me. So when I begin to see myself like that, guess what I begin to do? I begin to act like that. I got to a point when I began to become conceited. When I say I begin to drink the Kool-Aid, I begin to drink the Kool-Aid. I used to, people would be like, well, something different about you. The way you carry yourself is different. The way you act is different. The way you go about your life is different. And I was like, yeah, I'm different. Now, did anything physically change? No. But you know what changed? I began to believe what God said, and I began to reject what the devil said. Every day, we have to make a decision to believe the lie or believe the truth. If you believe the lie, it's only gonna take you somewhere you don't wanna go. But if you believe the truth, let me tell you, if you believe the truth, the only way is up. The only things are only going to get better. No matter what you are going through, I don't care how gloomy or grim it looks, if you believe to see yourself how God sees you, you begin to act like it. Guess what? I didn't just be around anything because guess what? I'm God. Listen, you don't see God just any and everywhere doing any and everything. So I began to change the places I would go. Started changing the people I would be around. I mean, I wasn't better than nobody. I mean, I thought I was, but I really wasn't. But I began to look at things different. How can a man, how can a child of God be in such places? How can, I, God wouldn't be up in here doing it. Listen, I ain't, listen, I'm God. I'm, I look like him. How look for me to be somewhere looking like God in there? How am I going to bring the Holy Spirit in there? This ain't a place for conquerors. This place is for the conquered. Amen. But I'm more than a conqueror. I shouldn't even be there. I should be on top of the mountain. And I began to think 
and my mentality began to change because I began to believe what God said about me. When you allow the devil to get you by yourself and to interrogate you and to question you about the very God you love and believe in, he began to make suggestions and began to make you question the very God. But I'm here to tell you today, if you hold your faith and trust in God, that no matter what you are going through today, he can deliver you out of that situation. And even if he doesn't physically move you from it, let me tell you something. I'm still sitting in this wheelchair but my mind is somewhere totally. You know there are times I forget I'm in a wheelchair? I, it just doesn't even dawn on me. And the fact that I forget, people forget. The fact that I don't even see it and don't pay attention to it, people will be like, oh, I forgot you was even in a wheelchair. I, I, it didn't even dawn on me because you don't move like somebody in a wheelchair. You don't act like somebody. And I'm like, I don't really know how people in a wheelchair act. All I know is how I am. So I expect everybody to be like me, but that's not the case. I don't even tell people I'm in a wheelchair. I remember I asked my wife one day when we first started dating. I said, does the wheelchair bother you? She says, no. I said, why not? She said, because it doesn't bother you. And I never thought about it. It just, like in other words, it wasn't a problem for me. I never allow it to be my identity. Yes, I use it, but I'm not a wheelchair. I use it to get around like a car. You drive a car, are you a car? No, you use it as a mode of transportation. I use this as a mode of transportation. It is not who I am. Amen. Who I am is who God says I am. Amen. Who does God say you are? Because that's who you are. Not what you wear, not where you live, not how much money you have, not what you drive or not drive. It doesn't matter because what you are is who God says you are. Amen. You are not your circumstances. Amen. You are God's child. You look like him. You're cleansed by him. His spirit is in you. And you are more than a conqueror. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. You are special. God knew you before you even got here. He loved you so much that while you were being made, he was sitting there watching. Amen. Making sure everything went right. So all the things you think went wrong, he was there saying, no, it was going right. Because, let me tell you something, everybody in this room has had something happen in their life. And God has allowed you to live with, with something that has killed other people. You know how many motorcycle accident people died? You know how many people get hit by cars that died? You know how many people that had common colds that have died? You know, people go to the beach and get a, 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 a bug or a, some type of infection and die. And here it is, I done been to the beach a hundred times and I ain't never get sick not one time. Mm -hmm. And you think that this is just some, some ball of water that we're spinning on, so revolving around the sun in a universe, and it was all just happened by accident? You're here by accident. That's what the world will tell you. But I'm here to tell you that you are purposely made <coughs> to be exactly who you are. And that God loves you exactly the way you are. And that you're his child. And that he sees you exactly how the word of God says he sees you. Mm -hmm. And that's how we have to live our lives. Exactly the way God sees us. Because how you see yourself 
maybe one day way today and another way tomorrow. You'll be the exact same way, but you'll see yourself two different ways. How people see you are according to how they feel that day. Remember when Jerry Curls were in? You wear Jerry Curl now. And guess what people will say? In other words, time changes people's opinion. Time doesn't change God's opinion about you. No matter how good you are, no matter how bad you are, God loves you. Even when we were enemies of God, he loved us. So the question today is, will you believe the lie or will you believe the truth? Amen? Amen. Amen.